Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Elizabeth. How are you? I guess it's good afternoon. <laughs> well, it, 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 it is technically yes, but um, we'll go. We'll go with the <laughs> the main uh, uh, person for today. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got bright sunshine there, which looks good. <laughs> yeah. Yep, we've got a little bit of a uh, little bit of sun coming in today, which is great. Yeah. No. Same here. Same here. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, thank you. I'm looking forward to the talk today. Right. Well, I'm very grateful to you for for doing this. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to to have you on the list and um, and look forward to what you have to say today. So it's uh, fantastic. Should we um, just trial the uh, PowerPoint just to make sure that that's um, all, absolutely. All working. Let me pull that up really quickly. Um, just wondering, all right, I'm going to play it safe and I'm going to do slightly lower resolution images. You can tell me if for some reason they don't look good uh, and I can pull out the high res version. Sure. Um, uh, actually, I, I might need to let you, yes, hold on one second. That should do it, I hope then you should be able to share. Absolutely, yes. Great. Um, Lovely, perfect. Oh, yeah, no, looks no, wonderful. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that's great. That's always the, uh, the moment of truth, but that's all looking great. Very Excellent. good. We've already got people in the waiting room. They're keen, keen to to start <laughs> so so am i let him in <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah well i mean i'll give it a couple of minutes just to um and then then we can invite people in and um i mean obviously you know i'm sure there will be many people you will know <laughs> such as such are these uh talks which is always nice it's uh it's a, a, a crowd of friends so um yeah. Why don't I see if I can move this like lamp that's in the background that's uh sure. yeah. no, we go. overwhelming yeah, the if... screen right now. Uh -huh. That might be a little, yeah. Is that better? That's great. That's great. Yeah. No, that's lovely. No, no I'm fantastic. No, I should... I just realized I should rearrange my bookshelf a bit because it's looking a bit bare compared to yours. <laughs> a bit too <laughs> empty shelves. Yeah, I should move things up at least. That's the trouble. I haven't been here long enough to fill them up. But uh, I just heard that um, I use like the IKEA cheap bookshelves and I heard that they're remaking them in a different way and oh. prices are going to go up a little bit because of material costs. And I'm thinking... Do I need to invest in like another empty bookshelf before they are replaced? Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of IKEA bookshelves. I have to say, I think they they they're strong enough to withstand you know most things. So um, yeah, so I hadn't heard that. I have a look myself. Just yeah, it's, sure. I think it's the Billy the Billy bookcase that's being yeah updated. So that's well, no, that's terrible news, really. I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> It's like, yeah. I, I'm I'm struggling to remember, but I think I think it was that they were going to use a more composite material or a slightly different material. Um, uh, well, perhaps it's better for the environment. Um, yeah. Hopefully, it's an also environment. I think it was definitely cost related. Okay, right. Inevitably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, which, and then they'll pass it on to us. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Right. How are we doing? We've got four minutes. So I think I'll let, let people in. Sounds great. And we'll begin to build the audience. Take it from there. Let me have a look. Just go to participants and admit. Oh, yes, they're coming in now.
Well, hello, everyone. Um, we'll just give it a few minutes uh, to let everyone come into through the waiting room and uh, I'm busy admitting people. So we'll make a start in a couple of minutes. Very good. Well, it's hit the hour, so um, I think we will make a start. Yes. And, um, welcome everybody, uh, to our uh, next um, Aura Board Association Research in Western and Central Asia. And I'm talking while I uh, listening to people. Um, and this is one of our Archaeology in Action. Uh, lectures devoted, of course, to art history and visual studies. And I'm uh, delighted to today to be able to, to welcome um, our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Knott, who um, I'm very grateful indeed um, for her giving up time to talk to us today. Um, many of you I know will know her work. Um, she's an art historian and an Assyriologist who regularly works in museum settings and also with digital humanities. She's a former Met Fellow, co-curator of the 2019-2020 ISO exhibition, A Wonder to Behold, Craftsmanship and the Creation of Babylon's Ishtar Gate. She's a former postdoctoral associate at Yale University and a current NEH Fellow. She is currently pursuing three research tracks, one on the history of writing and editing ritual texts in the second millennium BCE, a second on the nature of divinity, multi divine multiplicity in textual and visual sources, and a third on the modern representation and interpretation of cylinder seals. And her presentation today, composing cylinder seal scenes then and now is very much related to her interests in epistemology, 
and the role of digital humanities in scholarship. So without further ado, uh, um, Elizabeth, thank you again so much for, for talking today. Um, please do share your slides and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm really looking forward to spending time with everyone today. So let me just do the busy work of sharing my screen. Okay, I believe everyone should be able to see the screen now. Um, I want to wish you all a good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're at, um, and to thank you for being here um, and sharing your thoughts uh, with me and with the larger group. It's a, a pleasure to be able to talk about this topic that has been circling around my mind for a couple years now. Um, I also want to thank Paul um, for inviting me to speak. Um, and then I want to make just a few notes uh, before we get started. Uh, the first is that if you have any problems hearing me, if there's an internet connection problem, please unmute and yell so that I know. <laughs> I want to make sure to communicate as clearly as possible. So with that in mind, um, let's go ahead and get started. My talk today is going to use glyptic imagery from the Old Akkadian through late Old Babylonian periods to explore modern approaches to the study of cylinder seal scenes. The modern study of cylinder seal scenes is now centuries old, and the past several decades in particular have seen hugely significant advances in our understanding of cylinder seals. Yet despite these developments, our methods of study have changed very little. By and large, we continue to create, disseminate, and rely upon idealized modern impressions. Even as technologies for the capture of cylinder seals advance, scenes on seals continue to be represented through photographs or drawings of modern impressions. In this talk, I would like to contemplate the relationship between practices of representing and studying cylinder seal scenes. The questions and ideas that I hope to discuss result from a number of years of thinking about the experience and affect of old Babylonian period imagery, as well as my own reflections on a two year seal digitization project at the Yale Babylonian collection. Many of the ideas shared in this presentation will also appear in an article in a volume on seals edited by Sarah Scott and Oya Topchuolu. Both the presentation today and the article owe a number of debts to earlier scholarship and conversations with scholars, and I struggle to remember all of the ways in which various interactions over the years have fueled my thinking. Um, so the timeline on this slide um, is my sort of woeful and inadequate gratitude of uh, gratitude graphic, um, an attempt to say thank you to everyone who has made this investigation possible and who's made it such a pleasure to study the ancient Near East. So my thanks to everyone. I'd like to begin the presentation today with a discussion of several terms that have helped me think about the role of modern impressions in our understanding of cylinder seal scenes, together with a quick introduction to seal scenes and the specific material that I have been examining. Following this, I'd like to offer some observations on the methods of our modern practices of study, which I think may overemphasize the stability and integrity of the concept of scenes. Then I would like to provide some possible alternative solutions for imagining seal scenes. Established practices of study can become scholarly blind spots. Shared methods and best practices are important for referencing and interpreting artifacts and data across institutions and projects, but they also run the risk 
of restricting our insights. No representational decision is neutral. And when particular decisions are broadly adopted, these decisions quickly become naturalized and neutralized. As scholars, we always have to be asking, what did we miss? Identifying our blind spots and exploring our naturalized or neutralized decisions is therefore one critical component of research. Issues of representation are central to a number of fields of study, including art history, visual culture studies, as well as digital humanities, um, but also fields that rely on the presentation and interpretation of large quantities of data, such as archeology span and the historical sciences. Critical discourse in all of these fields have introduced several terms that have helped my own attempts to think about the representation of cylinder seal scenes and scholarly blind spots. These terms include pre-understandings, the scaffolding of knowledge, and epistemic cultures. In an article on shadow data in the field of archaeology, Allison Wiley uses the terms pre-understanding and scaffolding to introduce problems with archaeological data sets that can be partly redressed through the reconfiguration and redeployment of legacy data. Describing the challenges of working with fragmentary archaeological evidence and its interpretive instability, she writes, the worry is that what archaeologists recognize as data and what they infer to be its evidentiary significance are necessarily functions of the pre-understandings they bring to bear. These include assumptions about the cultural historical subjects they study, as well as an enormously diverse range of background knowledge and technical resources that inform their use of surviving material traces as evidence. Wiley therefore refers to the assumptions, the knowledge and the resources used by scholars as conceptual and technical scaffolding. Evidence in critical discussions like Wiley's is not a neutral term. Evidence has to be put to work. And in the process of putting evidence to work, we create interpretive structures or scaffolds that are not impartial. Our inability to free evidence from our own interpretive biases is often described as an epistemic anxiety an anxiety that all historical sciences must contend with. If we put evidence to work in particular ways, creating particular infrastructures or scaffolds of knowledge, then our whole way of approaching the materials that we study can be referred to as an epistemic culture. Critical theory in digital humanities and historical sciences acknowledges the existence of multiple epistemic cultures, that is, the exist the existence of different ways of knowing and different scaffolds of knowledge. Reconfiguring our own scaffolds of knowledge thus becomes one central task of critical scholarship. Visual arts specialist and philosopher Laura Marx argues that we can better connect to media objects by seeking out their filters or unfolding their histories of making. She argues that what is not immediately apparent, quote, exists in an implicate form. Specifically, she says that what arrives to our perception consists of some aspect of the world that has been in some way selected, filtered, and encoded. Thus, we need to analyze the image in light of the filter that produced it to get a sense of the source from which it arose. For Marx, the purpose of unfolding digital culture is to better connect receivers to objects and to feel the work and ideas that lie behind the production of a particular object or asset. By asking us to engage with histories of mediation, to reveal and in some way to experience the scaffolding of our knowledge, 
Marx is not only addressing the epistemic anxieties of the historical sciences, she is also bringing our awareness back to the affective capabilities of representations to dwell on, to unfold, and to experience and feel a particular representational approach provides a deeper awareness of the relationship between doing and knowing. Inspired by these various works, I would like to suggest that we might look back to our own methods of glyptic study, seeking out the scaffolding of our knowledge, identifying our own epistemic culture, and feeling the ways in which our methods of representation and research affect our interpretations. For glyptic studies, I would like to explore the concept of cylinder seal scenes and how the modern creation of and reliance upon impressions with carefully defined scenes may limit in some ways our thinking about these objects. The concept of seal scenes is probably familiar to everyone here, as the identification of scene types is one of the long standing tenets of glyptic scholarship, together with style and iconography. Introductions to glyptic studies use scene types to guide historical overviews um, and examples of various scene types uh, that you might come across in these works include banquets, libation, offering and worship contests, hunts, agriculture, and nature, and much more. My own research has focused on so-called presentation scenes that are found on cylinder seals beginning in the old Akkadian period and continue to be used on seals into the old Babylonian period. But I think that what I have to say about representing and studying presentation scenes may be of relevance to the study of cylinder seals more generally. Presentation scenes are often defined by their use of a particular cast of characters and a particular arrangement of these figures. The cast of characters found in presentation scenes includes what has been identified as a primary figure or patron, a worshiper, supplicant or client, and an intermediary or mediator figure. Often, Though not always, the intermediary figure is shown as the link between the quote unquote patron and client, leading the worshiper or supplicant into the presence of the primary figure and creating a particular hierarchical structure. The very term presentation scene has been contested in scholarship, both for its taxonomic utility and semantic correctness. As observed by several scholars, the term presentation scene has been used to refer to a geographically, temporically, and stylistically wide range of glyptic evidence that in fact includes several different configurations of individual figures whose arrangement, posture, and gestures can differ. In some configurations, the scene appears to correspond to what may have been an actual scene of offering, libation, or worship that took place at temples and shrines. In other configurations, the figure appears to interact in a way that could parallel royal audiences or scenes of appointment or investiture. And of course, in some cases, the scenes may represent imagined interactions and should not be seen as illustrations of real world events. Given that configurations of the figures vary and that the various configurations do not all seem to correspond to the same generic event, it makes sense to question the appropriateness of the use of the term presentation scene to describe and classify such scenes. This is a legitimate concern, but it is not one that I will address in the course of this paper. I think that my approach to presentation scenes, um, where I can use presentation scene in a broadly defined way, uh, can be useful as it invites us to think about the study of scene composition more generally. 
Therefore, for the purposes of this paper, I'll be using the term presentation scene in a broad sense and only occasionally note various configurations. What does it mean to represent a cylinder seal scene? Representation involves both image making and imagination. Image and imagination are inextricably tied to one another. Our mental images influence our decisions about how we represent objects and our produced images of objects influence how we think. I do not think it's possible to chart the relationship between image making and imagination in a linear way. But what I will do is try to show how shifts in our approach to image making might help us reconfigure the scaffolding of our knowledge. Image making has been central to the study of cylinder seal scenes for more than two and a half centuries since the earliest publications of cylinder seals. Early published drawings of cylinder seals, as shown by Melissa Eppeheimer, emphasized the imagery engraved into the stones. We find not only profile drawings of cylinder seals that highlight the images carved into the stones, but also rollouts or unwrappings of the surface of the cylinders that show full scenes and flattened rectangular panels. While early unwrappings present figures facing in directions that match their orientation on the seals, the realization that these inwardly carved figures could be used to make raised relief impressions, along with the decipherment of cuneiform and the discovery of ancient seal impressions, quickly led to a reconfiguration of representations with figures now shown as they would appear in an impression that is, as a mere image of their orientation on the seals. The presentation of cylinder seal imagery by way of a modern impression is a well-established tradition within the field. Whether modern impressions are shown through photographs or drawings, they appear in almost every publication and online database. Our scaffolding of knowledge, therefore, is built around decisions made during the process of making a modern impression. In almost every representation of a cylinder seal, a photograph or drawing of the seal impression shows the scene in a careful, predetermined way. These impressions are not easy to make or slapdash products. Art historians, curators and collection managers who produce these images will often create numerous test images, alter the positioning of their fingers or hands to accommodate the particular shape of a seal, and adjust the pressure applied in order to bring out particular details of the carving. Many select a certain starting point of imagery of the seal so that the final impression presents a scene in a visually appealing way with all figures facing in toward one another or symmetrically arranged to form a balanced composition. Photographing impressions requires additional considerations such as trimming and lighting angles. So while the modern impressions that we find online and in publications meet modern research needs, for clear and legible representations of seal imagery, they are also highly interpretive and hyper-correct. Moreover, these modern impressions are very little like ancient impressions, where both partial and repeated rollings abound, text and impressions may overlap, and the clarity of the impressed image does not always seem to be a priority. Despite these well-known contrasts between modern and ancient impression making, the creation and use of modern impressions in scholarship still continues. 
I'm not the first person to raise concerns with our construction and reliance upon modern impressions. Uh, as already noted, the difference between ancient and modern impression making practices is increasingly recognized in scholarship, and there are numerous discussions of ancient sealing practices. Concerns about the biases introduced through the drawing of seal impressions and the practice of dividing inscriptions and imagery have also been noted by a number of scholars. Several scholars have suggested that our modern practice of cropping impressions to show a single 360 degree rotation obscures the infinite and unbounded nature of cylinder seal impressions, restricting our understanding of ancient modes of thought. Finally, there have also been several calls for the closer study of the materiality of seals, noting, for example, the ways in which certain stone types can obscure engravings. All of these studies highlight the fact that seals are not neutral bearers of imagery. What I'm interested in today is the ways in which representational practices are based upon the idea of well-defined seal scenes, as these scenes can only be accessed through the process of creating an impression. Thus, my contention is not with the cropping of impressions and the creation of bounded scenes, but with the entire notion of seal scenes as a meaningful tool of categorization that helps us look at and think about cylinder seal imagery. Nor am I particularly interested in how the material qualities of seals can affect the visibility of the imagery. Instead, I am interested in how the physical shape of cylinder seals creates particular limitations and opportunities for viewing images and scenes. In my review of scholarly literature, I have yet to find other considerations of the impact of the shape of seals on the experience of reading seal scenes, even as other even as studies of other media have engaged with the physicality of objects. And if anyone knows of such studies, I am, of course, eager to hear about this and discuss it um, after the presentation. With the rise of digital technologies and efforts to digitize collections, new modes of capture have been introduced to the field of glyptic studies. We may now find, in addition to photographs and or drawings of modern impressions, one or more color images of the seal itself, digital unwrappings that highlight relationships between engraved imagery and the patterning of stones, and virtual models that allow operators to explore seals as three-dimensional objects. These new imaging techniques can go a long way in helping us restructure our thoughts. Yet for all that these imaging techniques bring to the field of glyptic studies, I find that they all maintain, albeit in different ways, the integrity of a seal scene as defined by longstanding modern impression making practices. A series of profile views of a cylinder seal, often presented in a row, helps direct our focus towards the seal as a physical object. In addition to seeing various components of the larger scene, we can also observe, for example, the shape of the cylinder seal and the depth of carving. At the same time, however, the lineup of a series of profile images still facilitates an easy reading of the full scene. Because our gaze can move from left to right across the images, we can more easily reconstruct a mental image of a full scene. I think of this as being rather like a cartoon flip book where the individual images meld together into an overall story or picture, or in this case, scene. And I think it's important to note that no ancient person would have been privy to the simultaneous view of a single seal 
from multiple angles. Digital unwrappings reveal the relationship between engraved imagery and the patterning of the stone, offering a window into how seal carvers may have thought about the placement of particular figures around the body of the cylinder. The West Semitic Research Project team in particular has used high resolution digital unwrappings to observe various carving strategies that would be invisible in a modern impression and even less immediately noticeable in a series of profile images. Digital unwrappings also highlight Mesopotamian aesthetics as discussed by Irene Winter and other scholars. But while important for our study of cylinder seals, digital unwrappings can also be critiqued as unreal images. No ancient person would have ever seen a seal in this manner as a flattened band of color and engraved imagery. In fact, students who are shown digital unwrappings often assume that they are looking at a stone relief and not a cylinder seal. So we lose a sense of the shape of the seal as well as the depth of carving because of these flattened images. I would add one further observation to these critiques, and that is that digital unwrappings often maintain and even reinforce the notion of a discrete seal scene. Like digital unwrappings, three-dimensional renderings of cylinder seals have much to offer the field by way of reminding viewers of the physicality of the seals. Yet I have to confess that the interactive three-dimensional renderings of seals do not capture my attention in the way that I would like them to. Instead of thinking about the seal as a three-dimensional object, my brain focuses on the rotation, the desire to play with the rotation, and the awe for the technology that makes this rotation possible. We live in a culture of distraction and play, and I think in this culture, it is easy to lose the authenticity of the object in digital reconstructions, as these are disembodied images. For cylinder seals and the experience of reading cylinder seals in three dimensions, the elimination of the sense of touch in the online virtual rendering of a seal may represent a real barrier to how we think about seals and their scenes as objects. In a virtual environment, there is no need to think about how to rotate the seal with our hands. There is no overcoming of the interruption to viewing and accessibility that comes from the need to hold the seal or from the shadows, for example, that can be cast by fingers used to grasp the seal. Marian Feldman and Silvana Di Paolo have commented on the importance of the connection between visual and haptic experiences of seals in relationship to acts of sealing. And I think their observations can be extended to the process of looking at scenes on seals. Troubles with image capture and the ways in which representational strategies facilitate particular ways of thinking about the experience of reading scenes on cylinder seals has led me to begin to play with different ways of thinking about how seal scenes appear in three-dimensional space. Playing with different ways of drawing and as you'll see, photographing cylinder seals has allowed me to think in different ways about the experience of reading scenes on seals. And through this playing with image, images, I find I have begun to reorient my way of thinking about and studying seal scenes. So let's take a look at a couple draft images. In this first image, my goal was to show the visual and haptic qualities of reading scenes on seals. In particular, I find that as I rotate a seal in my hand, my thumb and forefinger 
are typically set on opposite sides of the seal. I can feel, for example, when my finger lies on the seated deity and what figure lies directly opposite the seated deity. In this image, my goal was to map the various sides of the seal, understanding which figures lay opposite one another. For this or three period presentation scene, the figures of the patron or seated deity and the client or human worshiper lie directly across from one another. I found that this opposition of patron and client and seated deity and human was consistent for or three seals with presentation scenes in a broader way. Using the same approach, I mapped an old Akkadian or three and old Babylonian period seal from the Yale Babylonian collection. In this image, I have highlighted the figure that appears opposite the seated figure or patron. In all examples, the seated figure or patron appears at the bottom of the image. I'm just highlighting that right now with my cursor. Um, and then above, you can see which figure from the scene appears directly across from that seated figure. A similar rendering shows the changing location of the human client in various periods and in various configurations. As presentation scenes are often described as presenting visual act interactions between various figures, I thought it might also be interesting to map the direction of the gazes of the patron and client in these various maps of uh, seals from different periods. Whereas the notion of visual contact is brought to the foreground in modern impressions, Visual contact between various figures is less clear when looking at scenes on seals. Whereas backwards facing glances and hand holding gestures are used to connect the interceding deity or deities to the human figure in the old Akkadian and or three examples that I have shown, the placement of the interceding goddess behind the human figure in the old Babylonian example, isolates each figure in its own visual plane. The disconnection of the figures makes it possible to create a stamped impression of the interceding goddess as a standalone figure. This standalone stamped impression reminds me of contemporary mold made plaques. The reverse of one early old Babylonian period tablet in the Yale Babylonian collection is in fact covered with such imprints of an interceding goddess. When making the stamped impression of the interceding goddess with the old Babylonian seal shown at the right, I noticed that this act of stamping, where I was pressing down the interceding goddess repeatedly, forced me to stare at the figure of the seated king. Altogether, these images have made me wonder how many different ways people in the ancient world may have viewed cylinder seal scenes. There's little evidence that people were regularly making the same kinds of impressions that we make today. Moreover, I think we should perhaps consider the ways in which scenes could be read and experienced on the seals themselves. How easily does the larger scene break apart into solitary images? What strategies could be used to link figures who appear on separate sides of the cylinder seal? Is it possible that there were established layouts for presentation scenes in certain periods? 
What might this tell us about seal carving practices and how seal carvers conceptualized scenes on seals? At the beginning of this presentation, I argued that image making and imagination are intrinsically linked to one another. The field of glyptic studies has extensively relied upon representations of seals that are based on highly subjective and hypercorrect modern impression making practices. Modern impressions show off seal scenes by creating carefully bounded images. Not only do modern impression making practices contrast with ancient impression making practices, they also continually reiterate the importance of the impressed image, paying little to no attention to how imagery appears around the body of the seal itself. We have therefore defined our research by the assumption that the impressed image is the primary image. To balance this perspective, I've tried to offer several representations of cylinder seals that highlight the impossibility of seeing a full scene on the seal itself. These new representational strategies highlight instead the potentially disjointed nature of seal imagery. They show how full scenes may fall apart into individual figures and how individual figures can be linked through various compositional strategies. And finally, how seal carvers may have thought about the placement of figures around the body of the seal. Seals are not neutral bearers of full scenes, and we may benefit from thinking more carefully about the physicality of these objects and the varied ways in which people can experience imagery. Without wanting to push these observations too far, I wonder whether one consequence of our modern intellectual scaffolding has been the linearization of our understanding of image making and imagination. In my readings, conversations with colleagues, and attempts to critique my own ways of thinking about seals, I have come to suspect that modern impressions with carefully defined and bounded seal scenes have influenced our thinking to such a degree that we may imagine these hyper-corrected flattened images as the primary natural or neutral conceptualization of a seal. As I was thinking about this presentation, Albert Dietz drew my attention to a quote by Edith Parada. In this quote, Edith Parada suggests that seal carvers worked from a mental image of the full scene, transferring, as it were, our modern impression-based images onto a three-dimensional surface. This quote and the presumed primacy of the mental image has been troubling me. If image making and imagination are intrinsically tied together, what are we doing when we put the chicken before the egg or perhaps the egg before the chicken? Why is a mental image of a scene the starting point for thinking about cylinder seal imagery? And to what extent is that mental image built upon our own entrenched understandings of seal scenes as defined by modern impression making practices? To conclude, I would like to offer three thoughts for further discussion. First, cylinder seals resist singular narratives or interpretations. A seal impression is not simply a mere image of a seal. It may show part of the engraved imagery or the full imagery. And a 360 degree impression can present seal scenes in different ways. Likewise, the seal itself offers multiple readings of imagery. We may think about the sequence of figures moving around the body of the seal, or what figures lie opposite one another, or whether or not single figures are isolated from the rest of the scene. Second, the very notion of seal scenes 
may restrict our thinking about how ancient peoples experienced and interacted with glyptic imagery. The modern study of cylinder seals has long been based on the representation of engraved imagery as a coherent and single scene. Image and imagination appear to be more fluid in antiquity than they are in the present. It may be time to challenge this scaffolding of our knowledge. Third and finally, rather than identifying types of seal scenes, we may wish to turn our attention to how scenes are composed. As I hope to have shown in this presentation, we are working in a particular epistemic culture that presents cylinder seals in a way that would have been unusual to ancient peoples. One way to bridge that divide between modern and ancient approaches may be to consider how various compositional strategies can affect the ways in which we interact with images on seals. Can engraved imagery as seen on a seal be parsed out into individual figures? What techniques can seal carvers use to tie various figures together around the body of the seal? Do various approaches assemble or disassemble scenes? How do various configurations guide our experiences of imagery and change our perceptions? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. That was a, a wonderful talk. Thank you. I'm, you're getting lots and lots of virtual hand clapping and richly deserved. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm. I'm pleased to say that um, these uh, these talks are recorded because I know several people who couldn't join us today um, will benefit enormously from from uh, hearing what you have to say. So thank you again very much. I'm I'm sure that um, it will have generated all sorts of interesting thoughts and no doubt questions. So um, I would like to invite. Uh, those now where we have an opportunity for Elizabeth to respond to them. Um, so um, either do raise your hands. You have, you can just simply now join us live as it were, if you want to um, uh, open up your cameras um, so we can see the audience. Um, and then because there's so many of you actually, um, if I can't see your raised hand, simply ask your question. But uh, are there, Perhaps we could, anyone would like to make a start? Ah, uh, very good. Uh, oh, I think, uh, I'm not sure, I've seen several hands raised in one go now, so. Um, uh, Take arms first. Very good, all right, thank you, make a start and we'll go from there, okay. Hi, Joanne, I think you're, oh, now you're unmuted. Uh, Okay. Uh, all right. Um, I was just going to make an observation. All right. Um, I'm the, um, I wish to have a cylinder seal. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and I'm going to somebody um, to have the seal carved. And it's mm -hmm. finished. And when it's finished, I want to know what he put on it to make sure that it's what I wanted. What are they going to do? The obvious thing is he's going to roll the seal out on a piece of clay and show him what it looks like. And that way he can identify easily by rolling around. He knows they're backwards, remember? So they don't quite look the same as they do forwards. It's a little hard to read a backwards image. I mean, I'm dyslexic, so I wouldn't have any trouble, but a lot of people, reading a backwards image is more difficult than reading a forward image, and the ones on the seal are actually backwards. So anyway, the, he rolls it out for him so he knows that what's on the thing, and then he can find the part of it if he wants to be, sometimes, you know, you just dump it on, but if you want to put something particular, like the one example you gave of, of having just the Lamasse figure, he can find it. Then he has a mental image of what the seal looks like, represented and can find the thing that he wants to actually plunk on the tablet. Um, so I just wanted, wanted to, to tweak your mind a little bit about the thought of completely separating the ancient experience and the modern experience that it may not be quite so far apart 
as you're presenting it. Sure, and thank you, Joanne, for raising that. I'd like to sort of raise an alternative scenario. And because we know so little about how seals were purchased and in what environment people could go shop for seals, um, what if there is a, a scenario where there's a marketplace with several seals and someone goes to look at those seals independently without being guided through the process by the carver? Perhaps they would pick up the seal and look at it in their hands. Perhaps they would make an impression. If they're making an impression, do they know exactly where they want to start without examining the seal first? Or do they have to play with that impression making process? So I think um, that you're, you're right, that there's a, a relationship between impression making and thinking about seals and their imagery. But I would add that there's no specific way in which that can be easily consistently done and that we need to also think about these objects as objects that you can hold in the hand that invite touch and that ask us to interact with them. Yes, definitely. Unfortunately, that's not possible because most museums are not going to be real eager to hand over their cylinder seals and let us handle them. It's, it's a real thrill in the British Museum, okay, to be allowed to handle the tablets that we read. And it is a rare, um, the people who deal with Middle Elamite um, figurines, they have a person standing over them to watch them and they can only touch the objects with gloves on up to their elbows. So this is not an experience you can invite anybody to have for real. And it's a shame, but you can't. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly why we need to have a variety of ways that we represent these seals yeah. online yeah. for audiences is oh, to yeah. challenge established standards. So yeah. thank you. Great, thank you, um, Joanne. And I think, oh, oh yeah, um, you had your hand up probably fractionally first. So um, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> sure. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for this very thought provoking um, talk. And um, I can speak on behalf of Sarah and myself here that we're very much looking forward to having it published in our upcoming volume so that we can generate even more discussion. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, um, I like what you did with um, holding and rotating the seal and looking at how the um, individual, um, I guess, um, elements were positioned on it. But um, I'm wondering if you also considered how the um, idea of wearing a seal in a way would also have an effect on how these things are positioned rather than just holding it. Am I making myself clear? I, I, I don't know if I'm asking this question the way it's, it's happening in my head right now. But. No, Oya, thank you so much for that question. And I have started to play with that, but I think I could play with it more. So um, while when I'm sitting in a museum environment looking at a seal, I am holding the seal with one hand and rotating it with the other, if, for example, it was braced on a pin or on a string, I would not have to use two hands to be moving that seal around. Um, in terms of how seals balance or how they may naturally fall or rotate if they're worn um, as a bracelet or something like this, this introduces a whole nother level of thinking about um, the objects and what becomes visible, what stands out to you through your daily interactions with the object. So I think there's so much more um, to be done in thinking about what we can and can't see on the seals. Uh, for me, the I think so far, the biggest takeaway has been that when I'm holding a seal, I'm grasping it in a way that my fingers end on opposite sides. So I'm very conscious of what elements of the scene lie opposite from one another. Um, and I think that that may be sort of a general sort of like truth for any instance of wearing, I'm thinking like if I had it as a pendant right on my neck, I'm thinking like if it's on a wrist and I'm adjusting it or a pin, like you're often grasping it in a way where you're really thinking about what's on the opposite sides of the seal. 
Okay. Is there, I, yeah. I was, I was, no, no, no I, was, I was just thinking, you know, um, the, to me, just the holding and looking at it in your hand really focuses on the function of the seal as a seal. Um, but if we start considering how it's worn, how it actually sits, um, you know, because of its carving and its shape and its weight, we're also getting into the idea of, you know, seals as bodily ornaments and not just as administrative devices, right? Yeah. And um, I was just thinking, you know, if, if you're if you're wearing, and it's, it's, I'm also thinking it's not just for the person wearing the seal. So, you know, if you're adjusting it, you're holding it. But um, let's just say, you know, you're wearing a necklace and you just noticed that your pendant turned because you were doing something and you would adjust it to sit the right way so that the person a person looking at you would actually see it the right way but that doesn't really have anything to do with you seeing it you know what i mean so it also it also communicates to the, the the people seeing you as the wearer of that seal um what do you want them to see or what they can see in the way that a seal is sitting and that you know, we sh maybe we should consider that also in, in the way that these um, individual design elements are laid out on the surface of a seal. Fantastic. I totally agree. Thank you so much for that point. Um, and I would just add that in that case, then we might also want to be sort of returning to the question of how the material of the seal um, hides or obscures the engraved imagery. I was fortunate to be working with presentation scenes because uh, most of them are found on these dark lustrous seals where you really can kind of remove the object from your vision and still see the engraved imagery. Now, another challenge is whether or not a figure extends across a full view of the a seal. So, um, for example, I think in some of the images I showed with the seated deity, the like toes and head of the deity are almost impossible to see because they curve around the sides. So you could imagine various constellations where there are some figures that are easy to pick out, like that interceding llama goddess and others that aren't. And then the ability to sort of pick them out on someone else's jewelry is also dependent on the size and material of the seal. So thank you for starting that conversation. I think it's um, fascinating and I'm really eager to see what other people have to bring to the table with it. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, um, Sarah Scott, if you'd like to go ahead. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. That was a great, great talk. Lots of lots of food for thought. Great questions. And as Oya indicated, I, I agree, too. Can't wait to, to read um, the chapter. Um, I, I, too, I think in the same thinking along some of the same lines that that Oya had, had mentioned, um, am really excited about the way that you're thinking on how the seal um, as it's held and then initially impressed on a tablet and then rolled that that initial um, contact, um, the the user is really going to see a particular image, particular figure, and um, that and then that that would definitely kind of make some type of mental um, impression um, on the user. And um, I'm wondering what potential that might have for um, looking at going back and looking at um, tablet collections, um, tablet archives, um, and seeing if there's any consistent way in which that um, that impressed figure and then the the viewable figure correlate across um, multiple impressions of the same seal. Like maybe that there's something there, but there's a lot of potential in that um, concept, and I'm excited to see if if other folks have done any studies like that, or maybe if someone will in the future, if you will, I think that would be great. Um, so that's just a comment, but I have a suggestion, and I don't know if this is maybe um, looking for a needle in a haystack, but I know that in the OR SIS impressions that I studied, there are a couple examples of what had been identified as a test strip where yeah. a piece of clay is taken um, and the seal rolled across it and it's just left like that. It, there's no reverse impression, doesn't appear to have been used in any way to seal um, um, a container. 
Um, and the entire impression of a cylinder seal is rolled across this piece of clay. And um, I don't necessarily know if those were test strips or if they were some type of calling card or exchanged in some way um, that may have been some type of receipt. Um, but I wonder, I can, I can, you know, try to dig up those, those examples and send them to you. But I'm wondering if anybody here or if you, Elizabeth, have um, come across those types of um, things in other periods and other um, corpora, but um, that may be another way to get at ways that the users of these objects thought about the composition of a scene um, outside of the way that we as modern um, viewers and researchers are. So that's kind of a question. Thanks. Sarah, thank you. Um, two really fantastic points that I want to address. Um, let's start with the most recent one, which is the question about the test, the test strips. Um, ironically, I was discussing those with Anita Lawson just yesterday, um, and I believe Anita's working on those. What's interesting is for at least some of the examples in the Yale Babylonian collection is that the way in which the scene is rolled out is more similar to how you would see it on a tablet. So with the inscription centered, rather than the way you would see it when we create our own uh, impression where you would have the like inscription panel on the side used as a border or frame. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to be thinking about what was the purpose of those. Um, sort of what context were they being used in? Um, I'm I'm tentatively wondering if possibly they were used to sort of help train scribes on how to make impressions on tablets um, so that this would have been used with a really particular professional group um, rather than sort of a broad practice of looking at seals, um, but I want to see where Anita takes that research. Um, and I'm excited to hear more about that from you and from her. You also, I think, mentioned then this question of where do you start the image as you're rolling it out? And I just anecdotally wanted to say that I <laughs> spent a lot of time trying to line up the seal correctly so that I could push downwards and create a stamp that showed just the llama goddess or the interceding goddess figure. I always got it slightly wrong until I noticed that if I looked at the seated deity on the top of it and just pressed downward, it was likely to align. So in fact, like I've always previously thought about how do you know where to start the seal by thinking about, okay, what's on the bottom and how do I get the bottom and the like perfect spot as I start the impression? But it may be that, especially if the way figures were placed around seals was fairly consistent, and it, I think it was in the or three period, then people had a sense of exactly, okay, this is the top part that I have to be looking at when I start the impression. And it'd be really interesting to go back and then look at, say, what's opposite, um, like the seated deity figure on or three seals since he's often framing the inscription or something like this. So a fantastic observation. I don't have answers, but I can anecdotally confirm that this is super interesting and exciting. Great, great. Well, thanks again, and 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 wonderful um, questions and opportunities for further research. So that's that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. So yes, uh, Joanne, did you have another question? Uh, yes, did... um, we, yeah, we were we raising the issue of the color of the seals was raised. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to point out, um, which you know, um, should know, obviously, um, that the most colorful and distracting colorful, distractingly colorful seals are the cassite ones. Yep. Where you have marbled stone actually used. And you'll notice that in those seals, the inscription sort of takes over almost. They're quite remarkable for the almost complete absence of figural representation and certainly no presentation scenes. So now it's a single figure, usually maximally, on them with those that in, in enormous inscription, which takes up most of the seal. So the most distracting ones do not actually have the problem of interfering with it. You know, the, the, obviously the focus is seriously on the inscription in those seals, mm -hmm. um, written on the seal. 
And so it, it's interesting that the, the choice of these colored stones then is actually designed for a type of seal in which the problem that you mentioned with the distraction of the seal from the carved images is going to be not as important. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, we do start to see these pattern stones in the late old Babylonian period. So that's something I'd like to look into a little bit more as well. I had a suggestion for what they're, what they're using them for, why, why they're marbled in that way. Um, uh -huh. I suggested that it's similar, and oh yeah, we'll find this interesting, to marble paper, which was used in the Ottoman archives. It has to do with authenticity. You cannot fake a seal that's on a stone which is marbled in a very specifically unique to that single stone way. Hmm, but you also can't, um... I know it's the authentic seal. In other words, that that's the, the real the real deal. The physical. Seal. The physical seal is the real is the real seal. And the Ottoman paper, it's the it's the object, right? That's that's authentic. The emperor. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed. It's an, official, it's an official document, and you know this sort of thing. So yeah, the authenticity of the document, not the authenticity of what's written on the document. So anyway, yeah, um, this physical seal, on the that physical is, seal, yeah, the physical seal. seal, but the Ottoman archives, it's it's on the paper that they're that they're writing the, the, uh, the things on. Yeah, yeah I think, um, I think you probably onto something though. The one thing I've noticed is that I get confused um, looking at Cassite seals, trying to remember which one was the one that was slightly more reddish or mottled or speckled versus <laughs> another one. So like while they stand out as being um, impressive and unique, sometimes it's hard to like capture that mental image of what is that visual patterning and color, right? Um, and I could, for example, mistake one seal for another if they both were uh, patterned in similar ways and of a similar hue or color. But of course, if you used it every day, yes, you you would know your seal. It's like sheep all look alike, but after you've gotten to know them pretty well, you can actually differentiate one from the other. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Paul, I know we're at eleven. I see there were also some questions in the chat. Yes, I think um, we could probably move swiftly to those, um, just so there's an opportunity to respond. Um, there's Aggie who asks, some seals and ends of the seals show enlargement of hole, as well as irregularity of shape of hole, indicating that the seal was applied willy-nilly without consideration of where on the clay it landed. Likewise, length of impression varied considerably, suggesting the same, that the order of appearance of images was not critical. I think um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, and please jump in if I'm not, um, I think that that's right, that there are periods where there seem to have been certain practices for impressing seals, um, and then other periods where there's more fluidity. Um, Marion Feldman has this really nice article on sealing practice at or in the or three period where it does seem like there was this sort of shared knowledge of how do you impress a seal on a tablet. Um, and I think there's a number of other studies that have looked at that as well. One of the challenges that I faced when I was working on this is that the presentation scene is used so broadly uh, in terms of a long period of time and across multiple regions and in different styles. Um, that I wasn't able to dive in enough to track like individual site or regional based sealing practices um, and how uh, consistent or non-consistent those were. That that would be future, future research and really interesting um, to see if in some areas the uh, order of the figures does become more consistent, or if the full visibility versus partial visibility of the seal is consistent. Um, I hope that answers that question, but definitely interrupt if it doesn't. I see there's uh, one other question from Constance Minand about translucent materials um, and whether or not they're 
uh, these materials were meant to have their engraving be invisible until rolled out? This is a super interesting question. And um, it relates to how you're looking at the seal and the way that you light the seal. So some translucent seals, I can actually see the engraving pretty well. In the process of trying to digitize these seals, we've tried different approaches to lighting, um, backlighting versus just a laser light that's pointed onto the seal. Um, and different setups allow you to see the seal in different ways. Um, so I guess my, my first caution would be that um, it depends on the individual seal itself and whether or not the um, translucency of the material um, facilitates or prohibits a reading. I don't know if there's like a broad single statement that I could make. Um, it is true that many of those seals are harder to read than the dark lustrous stones that I was looking at. And that is something that needs to be taken into consideration when thinking about questions of composition and experience of objects in other periods. Um, sometimes I think, I, I, ugh, I haven't experimented enough to know. I wanted to say like, if you bring some seals closer to you or further away from you, it changes how you see them and what you're able to see. Um, but I, I haven't played with this enough to be able to make any uh, sweeping statements. So I'm really <laughs> grateful for the question and I don't wanna try to answer it without looking at a bunch more seals and observing how I observe those seals and interact with them. Thank you. And that just that leaves us really with yet more uh, possibilities uh, that you've opened up as a result of this talk. So um, um, just the beginning. So thank you so very much indeed for uh, introducing us to this really interesting, exciting um, work that you're you're exploring. May I I'll just take the opportunity before um, uh, the final thanks um, just to uh, remind everyone that, of course, this there will be another talk next Friday, a slight change in, in the scheduling in that we'll have Helen Kreese uh, from uh, Berlin talking about uh, glazed brick decorations in Mesopotamia. So uh, another uh, uh, extraordinary interesting talk, I think, coming up there um, next Friday, the 9th of June. But for the moment, um, it just leaves me to again, thank Elizabeth very much indeed for um, that fascinating talk. Um, Thank you indeed for being with us today. And thank you to everyone for being here. I'm always happy to continue the conversation. Thank you and uh, goodbye. <laughs>